YouTube battle community, Love and Spoonful fans, random people on the internet, and my name is Giggins, and we are here today to talk about the Love and Spoonfuls album, Everything Playing. And here they are, they're all playing, with a bunch of cool, crazy monsters. Um, fascinating album by the guys, this was the last one with John Sebastian and the first one with Jerry Esther, and he joined after Zal left the band. Um, it shows the group definitely going through a transition, because you can tell that the good time, fun time music kind of took a nosedive a little bit, and they kind of just Banded on this thing. They got a little different, using some different instruments, different textures. Um, the songwriting changed a little bit. You can tell they're kind of stretched apart, but also trying to be a one unit at the same time. Um, and it almost does sound like John didn't want to be in the band anymore. I mean, not, not to say that he probably, you know, he probably did enjoy writing the songs on this album, probably did enjoy making the record. It just sounds kind of distant. It's a weird album in the sense that, like, there's some great tracks on here. Um, but it doesn't totally sound like the Love and Spoonful. It just sounds like something changed. And I guess that would be Zal leaving the band. Um, you know, sometimes that makes a difference. When one guy leaves a band, the whole dynamic changes. Like with the Franz Ferdinand album they put out after Nick McCarthy left, that album sounds like Franz Ferdinand, but it also really doesn't. So I kind of see what happened here. When a band member is gone, you gotta pick up the pieces and some new guy comes in and adds their flavor to it. It changes the dynamic. So... That's just how it is. Um, it doesn't sound like a collection of singles, and it doesn't sound like one unified statement. But, um, in classic Loving Spoonful tradition, lots of genres are here, lots of ideas are mixed together, and it does make for a really, really interesting listen. Um, I don't think it's my favorite album by them, but it's a really, really good album. Um, you know, not to say that they couldn't make an album without Zal on the guitar, but that loose, fun, crazy rock and roll vibe that he had is sorely missing on this thing. Um, you know, and there's a handful of singles that came out from this album as well. None of them sort of have like a lasting impact as as heavy as like, um, you know, Summer in the City or Didn't Have to Be So Nice, Do You Believe in Magic? You know, those core years of the group definitely are their most popular tunes. But um, there are a couple of tracks on here that have lasted uh, forever, including Younger Generation, which is the song he played at, Wood John Sebastian played at Woodstock. Um, but yeah, a couple of singles on here. Six O'Clock came out as a single in June of 1967, hit number 18. Um, so that's pretty good. She's Still a Mystery hit number 27 when it came out in November of 67. Uh, Money came out as a single, which is definitely a very strange song, in February of 68, which hit number 48. Um, and then there was a song called Never Going Back, which is a non-album single, which hit number 73 in August of 78. So, or, or 68, rather. So, um, you know, they were starting to slide down the charts a little bit. And then after Woodstock, uh, I guess their label decided to put out Younger Generation as a single, which didn't chart at all, but um, came out in 1970. So, you know, a couple, three years, almost three years after the album came out. But this thing peaked at number 118 in the U.S. Uh, in February of 1968. So definitely one of their lowest charting albums at that point. And I don't know, maybe that was enough for John to be like, yeah, I'm going to go do my own thing now. But um, nevertheless, the album opens up with a track called She Is Still a Mystery, and um, it's, it's got a really big, joyous chorus. Um, I think the, the horn arrangement on this song is a lot of fun to listen to. Uh, there's a lot of chord changes. This song goes through a lot of up and down changes here. Um, it's a pretty complex song. Gotta admit, there's a lot going on with this track. But it works. It sounds like a cohesive unit, a cohesive pop track. Um, the harmony vocals are fantastic. There's some really good tension. The, the lyrical... Um, uh, you know, the storytelling of this thing is a lot of fun to listen to. And the building on this song, the tension and the anxiety that they create, um, is fascinating. I think it's an excellent song and a great way to start the album. And a really, um, you know, it shows them going off in a new direction, where they just grow more as songwriters. Priscilla Mira, Millionera, which I can barely pronounce, um, is a really groovy, like, for me, I get like a really heavy monkeys vibe on this song. Um, with some really exciting lead vocals from Steve Boone, one of the only lead vocal tracks he ever did with the band, um, which is pretty cool. But um, I like the repeated lines at the end. It's a pretty catchy track. It's just a straight-up rock and roll song. Really dig that one. Boredom. Uh, leave it to John Sebastian's voice to take the idea of being bored and making a track out of it and making that track sound interesting. Um, you know, what a, what a unique trait to do. I like the countryish vibe on this one, the steel guitar and the laid back shuffle. Um, it's reflective and peaceful and definitely just a calm song. You know, and it really it just reflects that 
you know, kind of being alone on your own, getting bored, trying to think of what to do, got nothing to do, write a song about it. Um, Six O'Clock, this is a very cool song. It's got that really fuzzy alarm sound um, throughout this track over and over again. And again, more complex arrangements on this thing as well. So part of me feels like, you know, as much as the album is a departure from what they've done before, it definitely shows them growing. So whether it was growing towards what the Love and Spoonful could have become later on, you know, they only put out one more album after this, um, or it was growing into what John was thinking about doing, going solo, who knows. Um, maybe they're just trying to go out with a bang and write some really interesting songs before um, they eventually would break up a couple years later. Um, yeah, it's a pretty quick track overall, uh, 6 o'clock, but I really like the drums on here. Um, you know, they, they're playing with some conviction throughout this whole song. Really, really good track. Forever. This is an interesting song, a very nice instrumental uh, piece that has really nice use of horns and a big rock sound with lots of emotion to it. Um, and it brings out a lot of moods and feelings as you listen to it, which a nice instrumental piece should do. It should take you through a ride. Um, a really impressive track that sounds like a mix of jazz, bluegrass, some rock, some bossa nova. Um, you know, it's like if all those genres had a baby together, this is what the song would sound like. The, the baby would sound like this. Um, interesting track. Cool to have it on here. There aren't too many instrumentals in Love and Spoonful Cannon, but, you know, there are, but, you know, nice to have that on there. Side 2 opens up with Younger Generation, one of the most fascinating songs I think the 60s ever produced, um, and easily one of the best things John Sebastian ever wrote. Um, one of his most amazing tracks, because it takes what every single new generation thinks and says, you know, the first line, you know, why must every generation think their folks are square? Because every single group of kids does that. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, if you're 13, 14, 15 years old, discovering, you know, being out with your friends, discovering who you are, discovering music and culture and society, you're always going to think, man, those people are square, man. Like, you know, their generation was a drag. You know, their music sucked. Their, you know, their ideals were stupid. We got way more progressive now. Things are moving. Things are changing. Um, but it's been that case probably since day freaking one. And this is how it is. And so the song is great because it talks about, like, you know, kids growing up and, you know, taking LSD or, you know, they're talking on their video phone. It's a very forward-thinking future song about just, it doesn't matter how hip you think you're going to be. The next generation is gonna, still going to think they're hipper than you, and you're going to think you're hipper than the generation before you was. It's always going to be that way, and it's never going to change. So for people to be like, there's no good music today, you probably said the same thing about your parents' music back in the day. So it's one of those things where it's like, just get on with yourself. Things are always going to change. Nothing's going to stay the same. Um, amazing song. Just a fascinating track. And you know, mostly acoustic. Um, but easily one of the best things they ever did. And one of the best songs on this album, hands down. Which leads to the next track, Money. Which is a weird, groovy little track. Lots of heavy bass on this thing. Uh, the banjo comes back, which is nice to hear the banjo on a Love and Spoonful album. Because um, there isn't too much of that on here. And I like the cash register percussion sounds that go on throughout this thing as well. But just a funky little track, a fascinating little piece. I can't believe this was a single, but then again, who knows? I didn't live in the 60s. I don't know what passes for a single back then. <laughs> um, old Folks. This is an interesting song. Joe takes the lead on this one. And Joe's always had a great voice. Um, you know, the couple of songs he's, he did here and there throughout the, the band's existence. He had a really nice voice, and he's still singing with the band. Um... I like the flutes on here, I think I said that already, but the flutes are really good. They suck out my mind big time on this one. Um, another song kind of about the generation that came before you and, um, you know, where those people are. It reminds me a bit of Old Friends by Simon and Garfunkel, kind of like the, you know, sitting on a park bench, talking to each other, thinking about how terribly strange it is to be 70, that kind of thing. Um, but I like the, that, the background vocals kind of quietly mixed in. Um, it's just an overall enjoyable track. Well done. Only Pretty, What a Pity, this is a pretty rockin' song, it sounds nothing like The Love and Spoonful, but they really crank along with this one really well. A lot of fun to listen to, exciting group vocals, really joyous chorus again. Um, is that a talk box that I hear in the middle? It sounds very Peter Frampton-ish in the middle, so once again, The Love and Spoonful are ahead of the curve. I've said it before and I'll say it again, The Spoonful did a lot of stuff first that other bands would copy, including The Beatles. Um, the, 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 I mean, the Beatles were big fans of the Spoonful anyway, but you know here they are once again possibly doing something years before anybody else. Um, great piano work on this track, and I love the powerful drums, but that talk box thing, take a listen to that. The song Try a Little Bit, 
Um, instant groove. I love the the really somber violins, the passionate drum work, the eerie feel mo that most of this song kind of creates. Um, the chorus is a lot of fun with the female group vocals. Nice to hear that in a Love and Spoonful album. That's kind of different. Um, and it's kind of a hidden gem on this album. And it's, for me, like a lost classic. Easily one of the best songs on this album. And for the Love and Spoonful's discography, um, this for me feels like something that should be more included on Greatest Hits albums or just more thought of with the songs they created. This is easily one of the best things they ever did as well. Very fascinating track. And then the last track on here, Close Your Eyes, excellent piano work on here. It's pretty trippy, great use of the horn section to make some more emotional, um, dynamic presentation happen. It's pretty compelling. Um, but again, it's one of those tracks where it sounds like nothing they ever did before. And in that sense, it is exciting and it's a little bit different. And you kind of get excited to what would have may have happened next had John stayed in the band. But of course, he didn't. And the core of the band changed and their dynamic changed and they made one more album and that was it. Um, so here's the back cover. Good shot of the guys. Joe was growing a mustache here. John's got, John got some new glasses, but, um, there's the song titles. For me, I like the album cover a lot because it's just kind of like, I love the home brew kind of cover. Just someone did a drawing. I'm not sure who drew this. I can't see any names on here anywhere, but, uh, I don't think it says on the front. Well, let's see if it says on the back here. Cover art, John B. Sebastian. Look at that. I... I should have read this beforehand. John drew the cover. Okay. Maybe he really wasn't in the band at this point. I don't know. <laughs> um, that's fascinating. Look at that. Huh. Liner photo by Henry Diltz. So some guy named Henry Diltz took that picture. But John drew the cover. That is cool. And on the inside, you get the old school Kama Sutra label with a couple of great shots of the guys. The Love and Spoonful. One of the most underrated bands of all time. So... There you go. Here's the label. The old Kama Sutra label, which you can barely see because of my lighting here. I promise I'm going to get better lighting at some point. Um, just got to afford it first. Let me hold it back a little bit. There you go. Now you can see it. Yeah, looks good. So, with that recent discovery of John drawing the album cover, I'm wondering um, what happened. I wonder if he got bored. I wonder if he just wanted to try something different. Did he miss Zal? Um, you know, why did he leave the group? Uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about that, besides just doing a solo thing, because he had a pretty good solo career. He ended up writing, you know, the Welcome Back song, and like the, I think he did the song for Care Bears. Um, so he did a lot of TV work, but he also had a couple of solo songs that were pretty big. Um, so he had a solo career for sure after the group broke up, or after he left the group. Um, but yeah, the group was never the same, because his voice was the voice of the Love and Spoonful. I mean, the other guys could sing really well, but he's the voice. He put on... Didn't have to be so nice. You put on Daydream. That's the Love and Spoonful. Um, so, this album really is like a transitional album for them to a transition of basically John leaving. So it's kind of like he had a grand send-off with some really complex songs um, that didn't sound like anything they had done before. And they made kind of a unique new album that's really just a one-off on its own kind of thing that just existed in this space here and that's it. Um, fascinating album. I'd easily give this thing like an 8 out of 10. Um... I really do enjoy it. I don't know if it's my favorite one because I'm really partial to the stuff they did before this with, you know, like their Daydream album or um, Hums of the Love and Spoonful, that kind of stuff. I really dig those albums big time. But this is a fascinating document as to where the group was at this point and the complex songs that they were starting to write. So for that, give it a listen. Tell me what you think about it. I'd love to talk about the Spoonful down in the box below. And um, that's it. I'm going to give this thing an 8 out of 10. Um... I really dig it. So, there we go. Love and Spoonful. My name is Giggins. This has been Love and Spoonful. Everything playing. I'm sorry. Yeah, everything playing. Yeah. Not everyone. Although they are playing. And, um, that's it. Let me know what you think. And we'll start talking about this thing in the boxes below. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.